Welcome to the first edition of the Immersive Outlook. Uh, today, we have in our midst uh, TV Narendran, uh, CEO at Tata Steel, who has been generous with his time to talk to us about some perspectives as to how does he look at uh, India, India's aspiration to be a developed economy over, the, over a period of time, and what it needs to do to get there, and also learn a little bit about, uh, about the group and their aspirations in India's growth journey. So, Naren, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for, for your time this morning. Let's start with the first one. Uh, we are going to be celebrating 75 years of India's independence this year. Tata's as a group and Tata Steel have been playing a huge role in nation building. Your perspectives on the journey so far? I think Tata Steel was the original Atmanirbhartha story, right? It was set up saying that India should be self-sufficient in steel. I think the founder of the group uh, said that uh, we should be self-sufficient in steel, self-sufficient in power, we should have strong educational institutions. So Tata Steel was conceived and created with that in mind. And I think uh, over the last hundred years, we proved many critics wrong at different points in time and uh, done uh, reasonably well, I guess. Uh, we played obviously a very important role uh, in uh, uh, nation building, even before we got independence and uh, after that as well. And we've been an important part of uh, a lot of the infrastructure that has been built in India. We are an important part of the automobiles that are built in India, appliances that are built in India. And more than anything else, I think uh, we do a lot of work with the communities where we operate. And uh, that's been uh, the ethos of the group and a legacy of the founding values of the group which we've tried to live. Yeah. I, I would say that there would be very few people, uh, definitely in my generation and even today I would think, who would not know of the contributions that the group has made to society at large uh, and being such a socially responsible organization over the years. But you know, as you look at the future, we look at 25 years from now. We are embarking on our expansionist phase. We believe that India could look very different in 2047. We have grown very well. We've grown very well on the services side. The composition of our GDP is changing very rapidly. If India has to achieve the desired position 2047, and I'm going beyond the five trillion economy that we keep talking about, what do you think we need to do to meet that aspiration of ours? And uh, is there certain things that you think we as a nation uh, should do more of uh, and few things that we should do less of to meet that aspiration? You know, the concept of India is something which is uh, really been tested and been strengthened since independence, right? So to me, for such a culturally diverse country, geographically diverse, with so much of diversity to stick together, uh, is really a shining example of uh, how a country can be created and uh, uh, can develop. You know, so I think we should certainly preserve all the good things that we've done ever since independence over the last 75 years, strengthen it, respect the fact that we are a diverse country with different voices and democracy as a, uh, you know, as a way to run a country is best exemplified in India so that everyone feels that they have a voice and uh, I think that matters a lot. And we are also a very federal country. You have the center and the states. So I think it's very important to continue to work with that great respect for the diversity in our country and I think that's very important going forward. The second part is uh, obviously to continue to build for the future, right? Uh, build the physical infrastructure, the digital infrastructure, the human capital that is required and prepare the country for the future. And I think the government is talking more and more about that and doing a lot more in that. So even if I look at the physical infrastructure, the kind of money that we're spending today is uh, great. And I think we need to keep doing that for many years to come. Digital infrastructure, I think we are ahead of many countries who are richer than us, right? And I think uh, that's also a very important to drive inclusion uh, in our country and to you know really make sure that a larger part of the country which does not even have as yet the access to the physical infrastructure that is required if they have access to the digital infrastructure then they can get integrated much uh, faster into the country we need to encourage a lot more entrepreneurism we need to have more and more job creators uh, i think we obviously have a lot of job seekers but again i'm happy to see that over the last 20 30 years uh, you know, many iconic companies have been created, industries have been created, the startup ecosystem is very exciting. So I think there's a lot happening, uh, uh, you know, which we should be proud of. Going forward, obviously, uh, issues which concern the world are inequality. We need to see how to address that. We need to look at climate change. And as we create a future, we can have a more carbon efficient path to development than 
many other countries who've uh, developed over the last few decades, including the rich countries of today. So I think there is so much to do whereby we can create a future which is very different from the future that has been created by the countries who are ahead of us. So there's a lot to do and I think there's a lot has been done, but the exciting thing is there's a lot to do. Wonderful, wonderful. I think that's, uh, there are some key messages for all of us there. But one of the things, uh, uh, you know, considering the pace at which the country has progressed uh, in recent years, um, do you think we spend enough time on thinking about uh, the future? Or do you think that we are just too engaged and too involved in, in dealing with the present? There's a huge amount of opportunity. Uh, but the opportunity possibly in the future is even more. Uh, what, what's your perspective on that? I think that's always a problem, right? Whether it's at a state level or at a industry level or at a company level, right? You tend to get so bogged down by the issues of today that you sometimes don't spend enough uh, time of the future. Uh, you know, if, even if you look at the Indian ecosystem, right? I think we have some of the best policies in place, but it's the execution of those policies which is a challenge, right? If I look at uh, in the corporate world, again, all of us and particularly people like you and me who work in companies and institutions who've been around for a long time, there's a temptation to keep getting stuck in the past. We should be proud of the past, but at the same time, we should think about the future. So I think we should make a habit out of thinking about the future. Uh, that's a habit which uh, some people are born with or some people have it uh, more intuitively. Some others, we need to make it a habit for them. So I think that's a role that all of us uh, need to play. Uh, we should also recognize the fact, and I've seen this, for instance, uh, in Australia, which has a three-year election cycle, that the election cycle drives the thinking a lot. In India, we have a five-year election cycle, so there's a little bit more time. Uh, but we should not, in some sense, let that stop us from really thinking uh, about the future in a multi-generational way, not just in the next few years or so. I think institutions who've been around for a long time uh, are institutions who constantly think about the future. No, I think I, you know, that again resonates. And you know, someone mentioned to me that for leaders, 70% of their time should go in thinking about the future. Uh, maybe 30% should be to manage uh, what they're dealing with at the moment. But it invariably ends up being the other way around. And, uh, uh, but the opportunity for India at this point in time uh, seems to suggest that we ought to be uh, more overweight on the future. You look at from an India standpoint, uh, do you believe there's a huge narrative that India would be in a good position considering the geopolitics of the world and so on and so forth. Do you see that potential coming through or do you see there are, uh, there are roadblocks ahead? I see that potential coming through more now than, uh, uh, you know, you, than in the past simply because we've been talking about this potential for a very long time, right? But oftentimes the potential and the reality, uh, you know, the gap has been quite big. Yeah. That gap is reducing, which is good. And, uh, you know, and I think we have no choice but to bridge that gap. Because we are, uh, you know, for instance, one of the reasons why we have a lot of potential is we are a young country in terms of demographics. But that uh, demographic uh, dividend can become a demographic liability if we really don't create enough jobs, if we don't create enough opportunities, you know. So I think so there is a need for us to translate that potential into a reality. And I think uh, we are moving maybe faster in that direction and we need to do a, continue to move even more faster. So a so lot of work needs to be done there, but uh, uh, I think uh, you know, the focus on building the physical infrastructure, focus on building the digital infrastructure, these are all steps in the right direction. Geopolitically, I think we are in a very good position today because uh, more than ever before, because of the geopolitical situation, countries across the world are looking at an option beyond China. And, uh, uh, you know, again, we've been talking of a China plus one for the last 10 years, but a Vietnam or a Bangladesh maybe uh, went ahead of us. But I think, again, there's an opportunity because India is unique compared to the other options because not only can we be a great source, we are also a great market. So you can scale up in India for India and you can scale up in India for the world. And that's an opportunity very few countries offer. And that's an opportunity uh, which India has. So I think increasingly there's consciousness uh, that, uh, uh, you know, India has that, uh, you know, unique position uh, geopolitically, economically, demographically, and now with the infrastructure being built, it makes it even more attractive. So moving from the macro to the micro, you know, you talked about technology a little bit, and that's been a huge disruptor for businesses. Uh, at the same time, uh, we see uh, businesses, whether they are in manufacturing and services, 
even agriculture responding to it and leveraging of it. So how do you as a manufacturing business, how have you leveraged technology in, in whatever you do? So there's a huge opportunity uh, uh, for us. Uh, uh, we are not as disrupted as many other industries are, but we are always looking at our value chain. Our value chain is very long. We pretty much service all segments of the economy. So we watch very carefully how is technology disrupting our customers, whether it's the auto industry, whether it's the construction industry, whether it's the services industry, because they build stuff which you steal. So, so to me, uh, we are always watching technology and seeing its disruptive impact on our value chain. Secondly, we look at how can we harness technology uh, for two things. One is uh, drive better cost efficiencies within our uh, ecosystem. And uh, two is uh, how can we have a very different stakeholder experience. Uh, you know, it could be a supplier, a customer, a com the community, an employee, whatever. So how can we deliver a very different stakeholder experience harnessing technology that there is. So Tata Steel has been actually in the forefront of uh, this digital transformation journey. Uh, you know, uh, our sites in Europe and India have been recognized by the World Economic Forum as digital lighthouses, this is a recognition given to manufacturing sites who've been ahead of others in implementing digital technologies. And the irony of it is the three sites uh, out of our five sites which have been recognized are the one in the Netherlands, Aymuddin, which is more than 100 years old, Jamshedpur, which is more than 100 years old, and Kalinganagar, which is our newest site, which is less than five years old. So the new and the old have transformed, and I think that's a great opportunity uh, uh, you know, for us. And we continue to do that. Technology has helped us. Uh, because of our investments in technology, we've been able to transition even as a manufacturing company during the pandemic, right? So we could operate our plants with a much lower level of workforce than we normally had. Uh, we use technology to uh, ensure social distancing, do tracing, isolation, we worked in pods, small teams within the manufacturing plant. So plants were running full out during the pandemic. Uh, a lot of people could operate the plants or look at what's happening in the plant sitting at home. So because we'd invested hugely in technology. Even today, after COVID, we are very flexible. Our employees, uh, particularly in the offices, can decide along with their teams uh, whether they want to work from home, work from anywhere, work from office. We've left that very open. So I think technology, uh, you know, it's a great opportunity. It, uh, if, you, if you don't understand it, if you're not watching it, it can be a threat. Yeah. If you're watching it and understanding it well, it's a great opportunity. So another, uh, we're talking about technology, and I think you made a wonderful statement. It's nothing to fear. It is something that we could leverage and generate efficiencies. The one other disruptor that everybody has been talking about is uh, climate change and the broader ESG agenda. And, you know, at times you speak less about the S and the G. But let's just speak about climate change. And everybody has been talking about the fossil fuels and you know what's good, what's not good. Uh, at the same time, today as we see the, the geopolitics of the world and uh, you know there are costs and inflationary pressures which are emanating, which might actually uh, put a bit of a, I won't say a full stop, but which might deter people from going on that path. You have a global business. How do you see Tata Steel responding to this potential conundrum in the, which is in the minds of many? So it's a very important subject uh, for us in Tata Steel because uh, uh, steel is uh, one of the hard to abate sectors. Steel accounts for 8% of the carbon footprint in the world. Uh, uh, but on the other side, steel is the most commonly used metal in the world. You know, uh, And so in fact, recently there was an article which said that there are four or five materials which you can't do without, which emits a lot of carbon and steel is one of them. The good news is there are technologies available today. It just needs to get scaled up, right? So at a very fundamental level, uh, you can recycle steel. Steel is infinitely recyclable. So if the energy source is green, technically you can make green steel by melting steel, uh, you know. But there's a limit to the kind of steels that you can make with that. So you need the other process route, which is making steel from iron ore. Today, you make steel from iron ore using coal, which is uh, not just an energy source, it's a reductant. But tomorrow you could substitute that coal with gas, if gas is available in plenty, and th thereafter substitute uh, gas with hydrogen. So that's a process route which uh, the steel industry is looking at. In Europe, we are moving quite fast because the ecosystem there, the policy framework, the infrastructure for gas, hydrogen, etc., is being created much faster than it is in the rest of the world. So in Netherlands, we've already said that we're going to transition from coal to gas to hydrogen. In the UK, which exports a lot of steel scrap, the, the process route we are following is to melt the scrap and use green energy if it's available to melt that. In India, we have a lot of sites in the east. When gas is available in the east, we will start using gas instead of coal. 
We are also setting up recycling based steel making facilities in the north, west and south. We have announced uh, as a group and as Tata Steel that we will be net zero by 2045. Uh, but I think what I w at a larger level, I think we should not underestimate the cost and complexity of this transition. And uh, you know, for instance, even if I look at steel, the cost of steel is going to go up when you make it through these process routes more than the existing process route. So that cost has to be in some sense shared between the industry, who will obviously have to bear part of those costs, the customers who should, who should be willing to pay more, and the governments who should help in this transition. Uh, Europe also has a carbon border adjustment mechanism to ensure that uh, steel industry in Europe who transitions into greener steels are not uh, disadvantaged because somebody else is making uh, more carbon inefficient steel outside which is cheaper and shipping it into the country. So I think it needs to be a coordinated effort between the multiple agencies involved. What you're seeing today in Europe because gas prices go up once it impacts the consumers because today the climate change story has largely been a B2B story. But once it starts Im uh, impacting uh, consumers and they start paying more because of uh, actions to uh, deal with the subject, then it becomes a political issue bigger than it has been so far. So I think the transition needs to be thought through and India also needs to think through and plan this transition well. Right. You mentioned about some of the equalization measures in Europe. But uh, recently we had, of course, our export tax on, uh, on steel uh, coming in. How do you see something like that? And also more broadly policy intervention uh, in business. So I think from, uh, I mean, I, I make clear it's, uh, it may have been a good idea in a very narrow sense at that point in time to give a message and to deal with inflation. But uh, if I look at it over a longer time span, I think it's not a good idea at all. Because I think when you look at long capital cycle, uh, long cap, uh, capital, long cycle capital in intensive businesses, policy stability is more important than anything else, right? So today, when we invest in building a steel plant, the steel plant is going to come up three years from now, five years from now. You cannot have policy flip flops during that, right? Second point is uh, one has to decide uh, if it's private sector, then you have to allow them to make profits when they can. They will lose money when they can't, and uh, you know. I don't think one should penalize an industry or a company if they're making money, if they're doing it the right way, right? So I think that is the second point. The third point is uh, at, at an industry level, uh, you know, India is in a unique position because it has iron ore, right? Uh, most countries who are exporting steel today, the biggest exporters of steel are China, Korea, and Japan. They import iron ore, okay? If they can export 150 million tons of steel between them, uh, after importing iron ore, there's no reason why India, which has iron ore, shouldn't be exporting that 150 million tons of steel. Okay? This iron ore lies in some of the poorest parts of the country. Steel companies are investing in the poorest parts of the country, creating jobs far away from the urban centers. So for multiple reasons, we should encourage an industry which is leading private sector investment in India to create jobs in all these places. And India should be a big exporter of steel. India hardly exports 10-15 million tons of steel. Why can't India be a 100 million ton exporter of steel? So I, I feel from a strategic point of view, it's a bad idea to tax uh, steel exports. From a policy point of view, again, more than the tax, uh, uh, policy flip-flop on some of these things confuse investors. Uh, particularly if you're looking at attracting foreign investments, they will look at policy stability more than anything else. Indian investors may be a bit more indulgent, but I think foreign investors will really look hard at policy stability. Yeah, no, I think that point is very well made. Everybody says that policy stability, nothing retrospective, just forward looking. And uh, just tell us what, what the ecosystem is, uh, is in which I need to operate and I'll operate in it. But just uh, so those, those points are very well made. And I suppose all of us uh, would embrace that wholeheartedly. Now, if I were to move a little bit um, about the transformation that you have uh, created at, at Tata Steel. Um, and you spoke about some of the factors already. But I want to, uh, you know, get to the social infrastructure, you know, the human capital, the cultural issues, etc., which in some ways are very pivotal to any kind of transformation. I mean, you can run transformation, but eventually somebody has to deliver it, right? It has to be our people. What, what role has that played in the transformation that you have uh, generated at Tata Steel? It's a very important part of our journey and, uh, you know, constantly we encourage our people uh, to keep thinking about the future. 
uh, you know, we are blessed with very passionate and committed employees. Uh, in fact, at the lower levels, at the workers, we even have sixth generation employees, right? So that's the kind of emotional commitment people have in the company, right? That's good news and bad news. The good news is they're willing to do anything for the company. The bad news is you tend to get stuck in the past. You tend to keep talking of this was what used to happen. So how do you preserve what has been good? How do you preserve what needs to be preserved? How do you inject what needs to be injected? How do you strengthen what is there but needs to be strengthened, right? So we, apart from all the targets that we set ourselves, etc., at a very fundamental level, we said as an organization, we have to be future ready. And that future ready means we have to be structurally future ready, culturally future ready, and financially future ready. Uh, structurally future ready and financially future ready was a little bit more a higher level responsibility with the board and with the management leadership because that's about portfolio choices that you make and the uh, KPIs that you drive and the financials that you deliver, etc. The cultural future readiness is something which can't be done unless the whole organization participates, right? And that needs to be led by the leadership. I mean, you need to walk the talk, you need to do what you want others to do. Culture change can be driven in only if you personify that culture, right? So there are multiple things that uh, we took on board at multiple points in time uh, and embedded that in the organization. And I think at Tata Steel, we have a way to pick up something, run it, uh, you know, uh, in the organization. Well, if I take, for instance, uh, what we started about five, six years back on digital and technology, right? Uh, we uh, started by firstly uh, sending our leadership team across the world to look at what's happening, see companies harnessing technology, understanding it, right? We had bottom up a lot of ideas coming up. On the shop floor, we encourage people to come up with ideas, how to use technology to make a difference to their daily lives. So it's not something which is just top down, it is also bottom up. We set goals, we said we need to take out $2 billion of costs using technology. So there were specific goals, there were, uh, you know, a kind of trips to open up minds, there were bottom up ideas, a lot of training, we did a lot of reverse mentoring. All of us in the leadership team, including me, had a reverse mentor, someone who is less than 30 years old, uh, you know, who spent time with us. It was a good way for us to engage with the younger demographic as well as uh, learn something new. You know, so multiple things. Sustainability, we got the Cambridge Institute of Sustainability to come and talk not just to our board members and leadership team, but all to the union leaders, so that they understood climate change as much as most of us did. So it was not something that management talked about, but everyone in the organization understood why it was important uh, for the future of the company. Today we are looking at uh, how can we transform into an agile way of working because all said and done, large company been around for a long time, there's a lot of bureaucracy. So we have a team which works, they are called the bureaucracy busters, whose job is to, uh, you know, bust bureaucracy in some sense. So a lot of these initiatives are going on. I think, uh, you know, the good thing, like I said, is uh, people are committed to it, passionate about uh, creating a future for the company. So once they're convinced, it picks up its own momentum. Wonderful. I think there are a few le leadership lessons for me also there. And thank you so much, Arain, for that one. Uh, I'll move to the last segment and I really have two questions for you. We are all looking at creating more outcomes, better outcomes. Uh, and that's fair. I mean, everybody, there are analysts who are looking at us, uh, investors and, you know, the ecosystem, entire ecosystem is looking at us. But some of those outcomes and the quality of outcomes I believe is going to be predicated on how much trust can you build in your ecosystem. And you know, we are all acknowledging that trust could be a huge value accretor. It could be value generator. How do you look at this system considering that, you know, such a wide span of operations you have? Trust is the most difficult thing to build and uh, it's the easiest thing to mess up, right? And I think uh, we know that and you also cannot assume uh, that if you build trust in one place, you can easily build that trust in another place, right? particularly as we are growing inorganically in multiple locations, uh, we have to invest in building that trust. Uh, it may be easier for Tata Steel to build trust when you acquire a Bhushan Steel in India because everyone knows Tata Steel. When you go overseas and acquire a company in Netherlands or UK or Singapore or Thailand, you need to work harder. They may not know you as well as somebody in India knows you. Even within India, we build trust in Jamshedpur with the communities over 100 years. When we went to Kalinganagar, we assumed the same level of trust and had a problem. 
we couldn't start the project for five years because the local communities didn't accept us. And we had not invested enough in building trust with them. Right? So, so trust manifests itself in different ways. People join you because they trust you. Vendors are happier to deal with you because they trust you. Right? So I think it manifests itself in many ways. And I think it's the most valuable asset that you can build. Absolutely, absolutely. I uh, can't agree with you more on that. And, um, you know, our two pillars are really trust and outcomes. So can't agree with you more on that. But let me ask you last question, Naren, really. And we'll, we'll end in the way we started. If you envision India of 2047, what do you think India of 2047 will look like? Well, hopefully, uh, you know, obviously the second or third largest economy in the world for sure. I mean, at 2047, hopefully we should be a, continue to be a vibrant, successful uh, democracy, which is the second or third largest economy in the world. I think uh, that's something which we should all aspire for. But I think uh, how we get there is also equally important. We should be proud of uh, what we've achieved in the first 75 years of our independence. There are so many institutions that we've built. Uh, and I think we just need to make sure that we strengthen those institutions and we get to 2047 and have a country that all of us are proud to be part of, proud to be living in. Uh, I also think we need to address the issue of inequality. I think that's a growing issue which is manifesting itself in different ways in different economies. We shouldn't underestimate the impact of that, particularly in a country like us. It's not good enough if you have a $20 trillion economy and uh, only part of the population is uh, getting the benefits of that. I also think at a more fundamental level, we need to focus on health, uh, provide health care to uh, large sections of society because uh, it can make a huge impact. People uh, can slip a generation backwards in terms of uh, economic development if they have a bad health uh, incident. We need to address employability, which means both education and vocational skills. And of course, uh, employment, because I think a lot that we do needs to just get focused on creating jobs, services jobs, manufacturing jobs, but basically good quality jobs so that uh, we can really realize the human capital that exists in our country. Naren, thank you so much. I'm pretty certain uh, with the generational shifts that I see and how focused the next generations are, uh, we may or may not be here 2047, uh, but I'm quite certain that the generations the ahead of us will do us proud. Thank you so much, Narin, for your time. Thank you. Afternoon. While we may not be, I'm sure our institutions will be around. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. And, um, and we look forward. And we Thank look you. forward. Thank, Thank you so much, Narin, for you. your time. Thank this, you. This Thanks, Sanjeev.